somebody got up a little early this morning, I think. <laughs> Happens to me sometimes. Well, let's, let's pray before we turn to God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering here together again and for spending some time looking at your infallible, authoritative, and inerrant word. We pray that you would bless it to our hearts and minds, that you would help us to believe it, that your spirit would feed our souls with it, O Lord, and would open our eyes to its truth and our minds to what you have placed here. Guide us, fill us, work in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we have gathered here together this morning, there are but two alternatives when it comes to the person of Jesus Christ and the faith of the Christian church. There are but two alternatives. Either Jesus rose again from the dead, or he didn't. Either he rose again from the dead, or he didn't. And this one thing, this one fact makes all the difference. For if Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, then I proclaim to you today that the Bible, first of all, is entirely false. My preaching this morning is entirely useless. Your faith is vain, and we should all become hedonists. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, first of all, the Bible, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, is false. Why? Because the Old Testament prophesied the resurrection of Christ. It promised it. And then we find in the Gospels the eyewitness testimony. Four eyewitness testimonies to the resurrection are clearly recorded. And then in the book of Acts, constantly the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is preached. In the epistles, it is explained and expounded, and then in the book of Revelation, we come to view and to see the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ in all of his glory in chapter 1, in chapter 5, at the end of the book, all the way through. It is true that the Bible then, from beginning to end, proclaims the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so if Christ is not risen, we should take our Bibles and we should use them as fire starter or something else because it's all false, it is a sham, and it means nothing at all. Secondly, if Christ did not rise from the dead, then my preaching today is foolish and your faith is empty. Why would my preaching be foolish? Well, first of all, we preach the Word. <laughs> We preach the word, and if the word is full of falsehood about the resurrection of Christ, I have no authoritative word to preach. And secondly, our faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ, and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is found in the Scriptures. We believe in the Christ of Scripture, in the gospel that has been written there, passed on to us by eyewitness testimony. And if Christ is not raised, well, then the gospel is false. There is no Christ to save. There is no hope for us today at all. And so my preaching then is vain and futile. Now there are some liberals who might say, well, even if some of these things aren't true, even if the facts and the historical stuff isn't really true, we can still preach a, a mere Christianity. We can preach the teaching of Christ, or we can talk about the way that Christ lived and these kind of things. But this would be of no use to us at all. And this is no Christianity at all. This is no gospel at all. For the Apostle Paul, when speaking of the gospel of Jesus Christ, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in the first four verses, will say this. He says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And then he says this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ Jesus died for our sins, and then this, in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And so the gospel that Paul preached was a gospel that was in accordance with the Scriptures. 
And if there is no resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no trustworthy scriptures, and therefore then my preaching is entirely in vain. I should get another job. Maybe I can become a used car salesman. It would be far better than preaching from a false Bible. Not only then would my preaching be in vain, but so would your faith. For first of all, the Bible says faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Well, we have no word that is truthful then, and we have no true word of Christ, and we have no living Christ to preach. So where do we put our faith if not in the Lord Jesus Christ? But what is faith in a dead man? It is futile. It is vain. What is faith in a false Bible? It is vain. It is futile. And so then our faith would be in vain. My preaching would be in vain. The Bible would be false. And therefore, we should all go out and become hedonists. Well, what is a hedonist? One that lives for pleasure. Just go out and get what pleasure you can. We're here for a few short days on earth. Let's go out and the Apostle Paul would say this in 1 Corinthians 15, 32. If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Let's get together next Sunday and throw a great drunken party and eat and drink and everything else. Why sing these songs? Why preach the word? Why believe anything at all? Do you see how important it is that Christ is raised from the dead? How important this truth is, this fact is. All of Christianity, if you will, hinges on this truth. If there is no resurrected Christ, there is no resurrection for any of us. There is no church, there is no meaning. And so I am thankful because of the centrality of this truth to the Christian faith that our God has not left us and consigned us to a shaky foundation on which to base our hope for the present life and our hope for the life to come. But he has provided for us a strong, consistent, and certain testimony to the fact and the truth of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to think for a moment about the four Gospels that he has given us. Think about the wisdom of God in giving us four Gospels. Four accounts of the good news of Jesus Christ. Four eyewitness testimonies to the facts of Christ. God did not just give us one eyewitness account. Not just one, but four. The gospel and the Christian gospel is unlike the Mormonism of Joseph Smith. They have one book of Mormon that was revealed to one particular man at one particular time. You think about the Muslims, the Quran which claims to have been revealed by Allah to Muhammad through and by means of the angel Gabriel. One man receiving some kind of revelation in obscurity by himself. Joseph Smith receiving a revelation, one man on his own putting together a book, people believing in this. But what we have is historical accounts facts witnessed by eyewitnesses, eyewitness testimony which Thousands and even tens of thousands at times of people witnessed these things that occurred. The Christian faith is not just some download from above given to one man in some obscure place, but they are facts. Jesus Christ lived. Jesus Christ walked the earth. He performed miracles. He taught. He really died on a Roman cross and he rose again from the dead and they were witnesses of these things. And just like in a court of law, we don't indict someone or we don't set someone free based on the account of one witness. We want at least two or three witnesses. And God says, no, I won't give you one. I won't give you two or three. I will give you four eyewitness testimonies to these things. And in these gospels, we don't only have the eyewitness testimony of men. But we have the eyewitness testimony written by men who were carried along by the Holy Spirit of God. They are reliable. They are trustworthy. So that we might be certain concerning these truths about Christ and the truth of his resurrection. And so this morning I wish to look particularly at one of the Gospels, Luke's Gospel. Luke was described by Paul as the beloved physician. He was a, a medical doctor. His was the only gospel that was written by a Gentile. God had three Jews write three of the gospels and a Gentile write the other. 
He was not one of the twelve. He was not himself an eyewitness of the things of which he wrote. But Luke was a very careful, a very particular, a consummate historian, if you will. He was concerned with accuracy, with order, with certainty. You say, well, how do I know this? Well, if you turn to the beginning of Luke's gospel in your Bibles, if you will, this morning to chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, you can take out the one from the seat in front of you. Luke 1, beginning at verse 1, page 855 of the Bible under your seat. And there Luke gives us insight into how he came to write his gospel and what his purpose was in doing so. So here then, in chapter 1 and verse 1 of Luke's gospel, we read this. He says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were, notice, eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. He says, Then it seemed good to me also Notice, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Why? That you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. And so what we have in Luke's gospel then is a carefully researched, orderly account derived from speaking with eyewitnesses and writing down their eyewitness testimony to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the things that he accomplished, his person, his life, his death, his resurrection. And they were written for a man by the name of Theophilus, and they've also been given for all of us who would read his gospel for what purpose? That Theophilus and you and I might have certainty he says, concerning the things we have been taught. Certainty. This is Luke's goal. He has this orderly account, these eyewitness testimonies, carefully researched. And many, many who have studied the history of Luke's gospel affirm this, both secular and those who believe in the truth that he gives here. Might have certainty. And so I wish this morning to spend some time then turning to the account of the resurrection in Luke 24, verses 1 to 12, that we might look there at his orderly account of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ so that we might have certainty concerning this central and core doctrine of the Christian faith. We begin then in Luke 24, beginning at verse 1. I'll read the first three verses. It says, But on the first day of the week at early dawn they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now here then, in these verses, we're confronted with the fact of the empty tomb. The fact of the empty tomb is recorded here. Is this a fact? Well, Luke has some eyewitness testimony that he has been writing down. And one of the first things we do when we have eyewitness testimony, we want to know who are these witnesses? Who are the they that Luke is speaking of, and are they trustworthy? And what we do is when we look at the context, we find that the they can be noted in the verses that precede it. In verses 55 and verse 56, we find out who this they that he is speaking of here in our text is. He uses this word they five times. And in verse 55, it says this. It says, The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb. And so we find in verse 55 then that the they are described there as women. Women, a group of women. But they are identified even more fully in verse 10 of chapter 24, where we're given some of the names and given some indication as to their number. Look at verse 10 of chapter 24. It says, Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. 
So there we have these women. Three of them are named. It's not just nameless people. Some people said, no, there's names here. People back in the day could have gone back and asked these people. Maybe some of them were still alive as Luke was writing. And did you actually see this? Their names are here. And not only do we have then one testimony to this empty tomb, not just two or three witnesses as required in a court of law, but we have at minimum five. It mentions three and then it says the other women, which at least means two and could be many more. And so then we have testimony, multiple female witnesses to the empty tomb. Now, someone might wonder then, well, okay, that's fine. It, but is it possible that these women went to the wrong tomb? Maybe they found it empty because there was never anything there in the first place. Or maybe because it, it says that it was at early dawn, maybe it wasn't very light and they just didn't see the body that was actually there. Or maybe it was a large tomb and they actually were looking in the wrong place. If they would have just looked over to the right a little bit more, surely they would have seen the body there. But notice Luke, the careful historian, notice he wants certainty about these things and he records easy answers then to all of these questions. Again, if we turn back to verse 55, we see this. It says, The women who came had come with him from Galilee, followed, and they were following Joseph of Arimathea, who was going to the tomb, followed, and notice what it says, and they saw the tomb. They saw the tomb, and, and how his body was laid. Then they returned, they prepared their spices, rested on the Sabbath day according to the command, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb. Now, I don't know about you, but if on a Friday I went to a place, I saw a place, I was there for a while with somebody that I walked to and I observed someone putting a body in there, if I went then just a day and a half later on the Sunday morning, I think I could recognize whether that was the tomb or not. They'd already seen it. They had already been there. They weren't going to the wrong tomb. And notice it also says that they saw where his body was laid. And so it's clear that not only did these women go to the right tomb, but they knew where the body was in the tomb. And then we find in the text that not only then did they know where the body was, but when they got there and found the stone rolled away, notice what it says in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 24. It says, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They didn't just sit merely outside the tomb, take a casual glance while it was still dark and go, oh, there's no body, let's go home. No, they actually saw the stone rolled away. They knew where it had been laid. They went in, they looked, and they went, he is not here. Multiple, multiple, multiple witnesses then of this empty tomb. Now, the skeptic might suggest the reason that Christ was not there was because he actually didn't die at all. Maybe he had just swooned. Maybe he had become unconscious for a time because of the pain. Maybe he had gone into some kind of coma for a little while so that he actually had not died. And so when the stone had been rolled away, somehow he got out on his own. But what we find earlier on is Luke wants to ensure that we understand that Christ actually had died. And not only then did these women see the death of Christ, but many others as well. A large crowd was there and a Roman centurion whose job it was to make sure that the person on the cross died. He did this all the time. He did it for his regular occupation. Now, if it was one of us, maybe, you know, we don't do this kind of thing regularly, but he was doing this all the time. He knew. So we notice in chapter 23, verse 46, which we read earlier, Notice the description there of the crowd, the centurion, and that these women had seen him die. Luke 23, 46, it says, Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And then it says, and all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And then this, and all his acquaintances, and 
the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Not only do we have Luke's account, but in other gospel accounts, it explains how because it was the Sabbath and they wanted to take the bodies down from the cross and didn't want them there on the Sabbath, they decided to break the legs of those who were there so that they would die more quickly. And they broke the legs of both of the thieves on the cross, but with Christ, when they came to him, they realized he was already dead. And then what happened is one of them took a spear and shoved it in, and out came blood and water, and it was certain that Christ was dead. And so these women had heard his final words. They had witnessed his death. They knew that Christ was dead. They then watched Joseph of Arimathea, who the, the text speaks about, take down his body, wrapped it in burial clothes. They followed him to the tomb, and they witnessed his burial. And thus they knew for certain that he was dead and buried. That's why it says this in verse 56. It says, Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. Now these spices were not food spices, and these ointments weren't beauty ointments, but they were the kind used to prepare bodies for burial. And you might ask, well, why wasn't then this done prior to Christ's burial? Why did they do this after like this? Well, again, the answer is in our text, there was not enough time. Why? Because the Sabbath, the day of rest, was beginning. So it says at the second half of verse 56, on the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. So the Sabbath was right there, and so they quickly, Joseph and Mary and Matthea, wrapped up his body, put it in the tomb to get it in the tomb before the Sabbath, and then the ladies couldn't then prepare the body for burial, and so they waited on the Sabbath, and that's why then when they arose right away on the first day of the week, after the Sabbath was over at early dawn, they went to the tomb with the spices they had prepared, expecting to find a body expecting to find a body. They wanted to lovingly, after the fact, prepare his body for burial. And so we can see then that Dr. Luke has made careful investigation. He records the kind of details, names, days, times at early dawn, and these kind of things that help us to understand that this truly is not an embellished account, but an eyewitness testimony. So that we might have certainty concerning this core truth of the resurrection of Christ. Now then, you can understand the women's reaction when they come to the tomb, they find the stone rolled away and the body is not there because they came to put spices and ointments on a body. They saw him die. And so at the beginning of verse 4, it says they were perplexed. They were at a loss as to what had happened. They were not expecting this. Maybe they were perplexed as to how the stone had been rolled away. Definitely they were at a loss as to what had become of the body of the Lord Jesus. Now their perplexity would quickly turn to fright before giving way to clarity. Their perplexity gave and turned to fright. Why? Well, notice it says in verse 4, it says, While they were perplexed about this, behold, Two men stood before them. But these were not ordinary men. They were in, it says, dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened, they bowed their faces to the ground. Now these two dazzling men then are two angels. When angels appear to men and women in the biblical revelation, I find that they never look remotely like the one in the Philadelphia cream cheese advertisement. No halo no wings, and they're definitely not women. Not because I'm a chauvinist, but because the Bible always reveals them this way. You find that the world loves to attack the Scriptures in very subtle ways because the prince of the power of the air loves to undermine and mock the truth of God. When you watch commercials like this, be appalled at them. Abhor them because they communicate falsehoods to people about God and his revelation. They make the angels look to be a joke. I don't know about you, but I've never, when I watched the Philadelphia cream cheese ad, ever got frightened and bowed my face to the ground. But here, that's what they do. An angel appears. 
Now the lady's perplexity at the reality of the empty tomb then had turned to fright at the sight of these angels. But it quickly gives way to clarity. Perplexity giving way to clarity. Because notice now what the angels will say to them. Beginning at the second half of verse 5. So the angels said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. It seems to me that it's no longer the women who are perplexed, but the angels actually are perplexed. What in the world are you doing here? Why all the spices and ointments? Those things are for dead people. Why, if you seek Jesus, have you come to a tomb? Why do you seek the living among the dead? For he is not here, he has risen. And by the way, they say, don't you remember what he said to you? Notice as we go on in verse 7, don't you remember what Jesus told you while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? Don't you remember what Jesus told you while he was ministering in Galilee? And we find, if we would read through Luke's gospel today, that about chapter 9, as Jesus is ministering in Galilee, he begins to speak of these things regularly and constantly, sometimes with just the 12, and other times with larger groups of disciples, he would speak of his impending death and his subsequent resurrection. And so we would find, if we would read it in Luke 9, 22, it says this, Jesus speaking, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Luke 9, 44, he says this, and you just think about it in light of what happens here. Jesus says in Luke 9, 44, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. And it says, but they did not understand this saying. Or in chapter 18, verse 31, it says, In taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day, he will rise. But then it says, but they, they understood none of these things. They understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them. They did not grasp what was being said. And so the angels reminded the women of Jesus' teaching concerning these things. And then notice what it says in verse 8. It says, and they remembered his words. And all of a sudden, perplexity turns to clarity. The lights come on. The tomb is empty. Christ told us that this would happen. He was going to die, be placed in the tomb, but three days later, he would rise again. And so what do these women do? They come to understand. They have come to believe. They remember his words. They see the evidence and they find themselves overwhelmed and they decide that they must go and tell someone the good news. They must proclaim this news to others and tell them that Christ has risen from the dead. And this is exactly what they do in verses 9 to 11. It says, In returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven. They were twelve, Judas is now dead, the eleven, and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And then it says, but these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. The same apostles, and Jesus said, open your ears. Hear these things and taught them over and over and over again that did not understand the words of Christ. Now again, do not believe the words of these women. And I'm thankful for this, that these men were not early adopters. They were not those who right away would believe anything, that they were skeptics because many of us are that way inclined. Many of us, when we hear of these things about Christ and death and resurrection and all this kind of thing in the Bible, you think, oh man, this all sounds to me like an idle tale. Well, that's exactly how it sounded to them. 
for a time. But the Lord would do something in their hearts and minds, and he would make it clear to them that he had truly risen from the dead. It's interesting, these apostles, they lived at a time in the first century Middle Eastern culture. They didn't believe the women's testimony, and that wouldn't have seemed strange to people in that kind of culture. Even in some Muslim cultures today, the testimony of women is not accepted in a court of law. And the Jews at the day didn't accept it either. Now, this is not only a backward idea, it is an unbiblical idea, for when the Old Testament speaks of there must be two or three witnesses, it doesn't say they must be men. The Bible was not concerned with that, but the Jews had adopted this kind of thing. And so then, people in that kind of culture might be now left to say, well, we've got a bunch of women's testimonies, which today we gratefully and thankfully would believe, because we believe men and women are all created in the image of God, and they are not inferior in any way. But in a culture like this, what would they do then? We have no men giving testimony, only these women. Well, God in His patience and God in His grace not only provided the testimony of multiple women, but would provide eyewitness testimony from multiple men as well. Testimony to the death of Christ. We find when we read earlier in verses 47 and 48, there was an entire crowd there full of men and women, and a Roman centurion who was also a man witnessing his death. John was there as well, we would see in his gospel. To the fact of the empty tomb, what we find is that Joseph of Arimathea, the fact that he was laid in the tomb, we see he actually laid him there. So there's testimony that he was laid in the tomb. And if we look at John's gospel, Nicodemus was there as well. And to the fact of the empty tomb, we find that the skeptic Peter can't sit still. The one who thinks this is but an idle tale doesn't just stay there, but he goes, you know, this sounds crazy. I don't really believe it, but I got to go check this out for myself. And so we find this in verse 12. It says, but Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves and he went home marveling at what had happened. Peter, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, the very linen cloths that the body had been wrapped in. Now they were there, but there was no body. Therefore, he was at the right tomb. He was there, and yet the body was not. And so then we have this fact, the death of Christ, many, many eyewitnesses testifying to his death, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus taking him to the tomb, the women seeing where he was laid, and then coming back and on the Sunday morning early at dawn to take spices and ointments to prepare his body for burial, and yet the tomb is empty. They see the empty tomb. Peter is eyewitness testimony to the empty tomb. But while this carefully recorded orderly account, eyewitness testimony of Dr. Luke's, is great, it is, we are thankful for it, it is wonderful, it is compelling, yet it is not enough. For an empty tomb doesn't equal a resurrection. It just equals an empty tomb. And maybe just like the soldiers and the scribes and Pharisees we read in one of the other gospel accounts will cock a tale that his disciples had come and stolen the body and these kind of things. A tomb without a body does not equal a resurrection. What is needed is further eyewitness testimony then to a living, visible, tangible, verifiable Jesus, resurrected, alive. And brothers and sisters, I'm thankful to say, and we won't take much time to go through this this morning as we bring this to a close, but there is such testimony. For beginning at verse 13, this is exactly what Luke gives us. Not only is the tomb empty, but Jesus is alive. And we read about these two on the road to Emmaus, and they're walking along, and they're chatting along the way, and all of a sudden a stranger joins them. Their eyes are kept from seeing them, but it is Jesus himself. And they began, ironically, to tell him about all the things that had happened, <laughs> as if he doesn't know, but they don't understand who it is that they are speaking to. And then they begin to relay the very things that we have been studying here, beginning at verse 22 to him. They say, moreover, some of our women of our company amazed us. 
They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And then just as the angels had given, if you will, a gentle rebuke to the women, Jesus now gives a gentle rebuke to these two on the road to Emmaus. And instead of now talking about the resurrection as he had told them, the angels said, don't you remember what Jesus said? Jesus says this. He says to them, and he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He says, all the teaching I've done, haven't you read the Bible? Haven't you seen these things? It's always testifying to this, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe. And is that not so often us? Foolish ones and slow of heart to believe. To believe all that the prophets had prophesied so long ago had come to its fulfillment in Christ. Then these, these people, they were still blind to who this was, but it says in verse 30 then what happened. It says, when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And then it says, and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And then he vanished from their sight. Now, if that was the end of the account, you might think, well, maybe they saw an aberration. Maybe they saw a spiritual resurrected Jesus. Maybe that's it. Well, we have an empty tomb and we have sort of a spiritual resurrection. Maybe something happened to the body. How do we know for certain that Christ has risen from the dead? It's interesting that these men, after they've been shown this, they can't again, like the women, keep it to themselves. And they go back to the very same place that the women came and they find the same people there and they tell them the very same thing. It says in verse 33, they rose that same hour, returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. But then notice what happens next. Now it's time for the apostles to see the truth. An idle tale a spiritually resurrected Jesus? No. Notice in verse 36, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. They like the women, though, it says, but they were startled and frightened. Could it be that this is just an angel? Is this just a spiritual Jesus? And they thought that they saw a spirit. And then it says, And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. This is a real physical bodily resurrection, Luke wants us to know, as he records this, and Jesus wants his disciples to know. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and feet, and when they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, do you have anything to eat? Does this sound like someone concocting a tale or an eyewitness account of what happened? And you say, well, why would Jesus ask for something to eat? Well, because he wants them to see again that this is a real body that eats real food and has real teeth and chews. And so he asked them for something to eat, and they gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate before them. Luke records carefully, thoroughly researched orderly account, eyewitness testimony of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his empty tomb, and his appearing here to these folks. Physically, touch me, see me. This is me. I am alive forevermore. He is truly risen from the dead. And so then you say, well, okay, I, I see this. Now what do we do from here? 
Well, if you've come here today, a skeptic maybe, thinking the Bible to be an idle tale, all this talk about Jesus and resurrection and these kind of things, if you are here today and you are like the apostles and it seems to you to be a figment of someone's imagination, you say, I don't believe and I really can't believe all of this, Pastor. Well, I would encourage you to follow the example of Peter. Peter at first thought it was an idle tale, but he didn't just leave it there. He had to know. He had to find out for himself. Not just someone else's testimony, but he said, I've got to know this for certain. He went, and he went seeking, and I encourage you today. You say, well, I can't go to the tomb. I can't see Jesus as Peter did. How can I believe? Well, God himself has given you all of these four gospels of eyewitness testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Read them. Study them. Go back and read the prophecies, the Old Testament prophecies that prophesied these things. Read them and then ask God to do what he did for these men on the road to Emmaus. For they still couldn't see him until he broke the bread. And then it says, and then their eyes were opened. And then their eyes were opened. What is needed is as we read the Word of God, which is true, reliable, and trustworthy, the Spirit of God needs to open our eyes that we in faith might see the truth about Christ just as these men did here. Even the apostles later on, and we'll talk about how Jesus said to them in verse 44, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. He had told them the word and told them the word, but what was needed? Well, notice what it says next. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. I testify to you today that Jesus Christ is alive that Jesus Christ conquered death and the grave, that Jesus Christ is a mighty and powerful Savior who can save those who come to him in faith, save them from their sin, save them from their unbelief, bring them into the kingdom of God, and one day raise them from the dead and bring them into his glorious kingdom. But what is needed is a careful reading of the scriptures with the help of the Holy Spirit of God to open the eyes, to open the mind that we might understand these things. And so if you've come here today a skeptic, be like Peter and search these things out until you know for certain. And finally, if you are a Christian here this morning and have believed on the risen Lord Jesus Christ, May you praise God this morning that your faith is not based on a flimsy foundation of just one person's hearsay and testimony. But God has given us the fullness of the scriptures, the prophecies of the Old Testament, the eyewitness testimonies of the Gospels, the changed life of the apostles who go forth in the book of Acts constantly preaching a resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Know that his word can be trusted. May this study of the resurrection renew your confidence and certainty in this truth concerning the things you have been taught. May you rejoice that your Lord Jesus Christ has conquered death in the grave. May you take courage in the promise that he is actually alive so that he can actually be with you always until the very end of the age. Have you thought of this this week? I kept thinking about this. This is actually true. Jesus is alive. He says where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst, not only in church discipline, but in church worship. He is with us till the end of the age, the one who conquered death, the one who has now been given all authority in heaven and on earth is our chief shepherd. He's the one who has promised to build his church so that the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Death couldn't hold him. The grave couldn't keep him from rising again. The gates of hell cannot prevail against his church as we march forward preaching this glorified, resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And just as the women, when they came to understand this truth, had to tell someone, And then these people on the road to Emmaus, when they knew the truth, they went back and returned to Jerusalem and told others. 
So Jesus would tell these disciples in verse 47, he says that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem, for you are witnesses of these things. And we find them going forth in the book of Acts, proclaiming the glorified, resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. May we leave here today with this truth on our lips, burning in our hearts that we might share with a lost and dying world that there is hope in the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Now you might say, well, I've done that before. I've talked to my family members and friends before. I've shared the word of God before and they just look at me like I've lost my mind and I'm telling an idle tale. Well, take courage, brothers and sisters, because that's exactly what these apostles thought for the longest time as Jesus taught them over and over and over. But then, but then their minds were opened. These people on the road to Emmaus, blind, couldn't see. But then the Spirit of God opened their eyes to see the truth. And the same Spirit of God is alive today to open blind eyes and to change the hearts of those who are still hardened to Him. If Christ can conquer the grave, can he not conquer your friends and neighbors and relatives who yet do not know him and can't see him? We have a risen, powerful Christ. He can still save. He is powerful to save. His gospel is still the power of God unto salvation. Let us go forth from here proclaiming this truth. For brothers and sisters, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us believe let us proclaim this glorified risen Christ until the day he comes again for his own. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for this great and glorious truth and that our faith is not based on a flimsy foundation but on the solid rock of your word that reveals Christ from Genesis to Revelation. We thank you, O oh God, you knew how weak we were you gave us these weak people who are unbelieving and, and feeble and doubting and you've given them to us in the scriptures because this is exactly what we would be like too. And yet we see how you gloriously came to reveal yourself to them and through their eyewitness testimonies continue to reveal yourself to us. Heavenly Father, may we believe in this glorious Lord Jesus Christ risen from the dead, ruling and reigning at your right hand, interceding on our behalf and coming again to bring us to himself. May it give us confidence, O Lord, as we go out and proclaim him to a lost and dying world. May it give us confidence as we one day, if Christ does not return, will face the grave. To know that if we are in Christ, there is no victory in death over us. For death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Death has been swallowed up in victory. Confirm this in our hearts. May we have certainty concerning these things, we pray in the Lord Jesus' precious name. Amen.